discussions with counsel at, at the bench, uh, it appears that the state no longer intends to go forward on uh, at least one of the alleged violations, specifically Rule 6. Am I correct? Actually, Your Honor, I don't know whether we have an agreement. We don't have an agreement. Sorry. I'm sorry? We don't have an agreement. So, okay. so the state, state does, does intend to go forward with Rule 6. I'm just going to leave them all in there, Your Honor. Then the state may proceed. Thank you. State host Jason Smith. Remain standing and raise your right hand. If you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the penalties and pains of perjury. I do. Have a seat, please. State your name. Is Mr. Paul able to hear? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Jason Smith. And what is your occupation? Uh, probation parole officer for the state of New Hampshire. How long have you been employed as a probation parole officer? Uh, I've been with the department for 18 years. Okay. Um, which office are you uh, assigned to? Uh, the Keene Field Office. <coughs> Who in the Keene Field Office has um, responsibility for supervising Rich Paul? Richard Paul. What is your name? Uh, I do. Explain to the court, if you will, please, um, how you went about informing the defendant, Rich Paul, about the terms and conditions of his probation after he got out of the hospital. I, I set up a meeting with Mr. Paul and I reviewed the standard terms of probation and any specific or special terms of probation. Um, and I actually read the terms of probation to each person that I do rules with so I can ensure that they understand the rules. You have the rules written down on a pre-printed form, is that how you do it? Yes. Can I approach the witness? Yes. All right, I'm showing you a one-page document and just ask you if you recognize what that is. Yes. What is it? Those are the terms of uh, Mr. Paul's probation that we reviewed. <coughs> All right, and they um, indicate a date of December 20th, 2013. Is that the date you want to make the rules with, yes. the, with the defendant? Yes. Your Honor, I'd ask that this be entered as a full exhibit. Any objection? No objection. This exhibit one is a full exhibit. All right, so showing you State's Exhibit 1, um, just explain to the judge using the form there how it is that you went over those terms with the defendant. Uh, I, again, I give Mr. Paul a copy of the rules to follow along with, and then I read them top to bottom so that I can ensure that he knows and understands each rule. So you read all the rules on that exhibit one, right? Yes. Okay. Now the person that we're talking about, Rich Paul, uh, that you went over these rules in terms with, is he in the courtroom today? Yes. One not for the judge? He is wearing a white shirt next to the <coughs> attorney hill. The record reflects the witness identified the defendant. The record may still reflect. Um, now, PBS Smith, you filed a violation of probation dated June 4th, 2014 against the defendant. Is that correct? Yes. I want to start with um, the allegation of a violation of Rule 10. What is Rule 10? Uh, rule 10 is that you won't use controlled substances. Okay. What if any conversation did you have with the defendant about his use of marijuana on May 14th, 2014. That was the date that I collected a drug test from Mr. Paul, which tested positive for marijuana. And prior to him giving that sample, he did admit that he had used marijuana, but no other drugs, which was what the test told me. Um, and what, if any, conversation did you have with the defendant about marijuana use on May 21st, 2014? That was in a regular office visit where he said he, he continued the use of, I think he said medicinal marijuana use was the way he worded it. It was the same substance though, marijuana. Yeah. And what if any conversation did you have with the defendants about his marijuana use on June 4th, 2014? Similar to the other conversations, this was during the, his arrest in, uh, downtown. I had a con brief conversation with him where he said that he was still continuing the use of marijuana it had stopped at that point. Right. Well, what if any indication did, did he give you that he was ever going to 
stop using marijuana? Uh, none. I think that in our, we've had uh, several conversations on this where he agrees that, or I guess he believes that he should be able to use marijuana, and that's what his belief is, and so I don't think that he's ever said he was going to stop. Um, rule 12C uh, is a, a special rule of probation, is that right? That's correct. And what is the um, defendant's Rule 12C obligation? Uh, participate in satisfactory, complete drug and alcohol treatment counseling. All right, and, he, and that's one of the rules you informed him, that's one of the obligations you informed him he had to do? Yes, that was one of the rules that was read to him on December 20th. And um, what can you tell the court about his fulfillment of that obligation since his release from the House of Corrections in December, December 12, 2013? Well, I reminded him numerous times that that had to be completed, um, and as well as the parole officer who was assigned this case in Manchester had reminded him that that needed to be completed and never was. I had set up an appointment with him through using Access to Recovery, which would be a free service to get the evaluation done, and he did not show for that appointment. Um, so he had, had never completed the evaluation um, since his release. Right up to the filing of the VOP? Yes, June, correct. June 4th, 2014. Correct. As far as you know, right up to today, he's never done it. Not that I've seen, no, no, not since he's been out. Um, Rule 12J is also one of the special terms of his probation that you went over with the defendant when you reviewed his terms with him, is that right? That's correct. And what, what was that obligation? And he has signs that were court ordered as part of the underlying offenses. Can you explain that to him? <coughs> yes. And um, what if any payments, explain to the court what if any payments for those funds the defendant has made? None, I checked as of last week and there were none currently paid. How do, you been, How do you go about doing that? How do you well, our, our collections process is centralized, so the payments aren't processed through our office. So I have to check online to see um, if payments have been received or processed through Concord, uh, because we don't actually collect the money at the local field office. And so you checked online? Last week, yes. And there was no payments made as of just that. Okay. Well, just tell the people who are talking back there that they're going to talk for you Oh, do I tell him to go repark my car? I'll be back. Okay, you can leave. Sure. Now, I want to draw your attention to the uh, allegation of a Rule 6 violation. What is, what is Rule 6? Um, not possess, receive, possess, control, or transport any weapon, explosive, or firearm, or any simulated weapon, explosive, or firearm. And also Rule 7. What, what is Rule 7? Um, be a good conduct of bail laws and be arrest free. Describe how, um, if at all, you first became aware of an incident occurring in Central Square here in Keene um, on or about June 2nd, 2014. I believe it was first brought to my attention on the following day through an uh, anonymous voicemail that said that there was an incident downtown that I should be taking a look at, which I was able to find a link to that, to a video off of uh, Mr. Paul's Facebook page, um, which showed the merits of what had occurred the night before. And um, so you actually found the video link on the defendant's Facebook page, you said? Yes, yes. How, if at all, were you able to um, recover a copy of that video? I went over to the Keene Police Department and met with the um, secretary or administrative assistant with the detectives unit, uh, Sherry Bakta, and I asked Sherry if she could make a copy of that in case it was removed, or the, the link was removed offline, I would not be able to retrieve it, so she would, had some software which would, was able to move the video onto a DVD. All right, and, and that was successful. The video you saw via a link on the friend's Facebook page was copied onto a DVD. Correct. Or a disc, whatever. All right. Um, were there any other, what, what if any other corroboration did you get that this occurred on June 2nd, 2014? Or was it just a tip or anything else? That, that was it. I mean, just that in, in the post 
he posted some things on Facebook about an incident occurring the night before and gave some thanks to some people that helped him during the incident. So it was just the information that was found on, online. Okay, on his Facebook page yeah. in conjunction with the video itself, which was labeled with that date, is that right? Yes. Do you have a copy of the video? Did you bring a copy with you? Yes. Is that the same video that we watched um, at the bail hearing a couple of weeks ago? Yes, it is. Um, the quality of the video on the wall, not quite as good as on the computer, is that right? Yes, it was difficult to see um, against the white wall, yes, with the projector. You, you have a copy with you right now? Yes, I do. All right. And this, so this is the video that you got the way you just explained? Yes. Move to enter this as exhibit number two. Your Honor, I'm to the, the addition of the video. I think that the foundation requires someone to say that this is, in fact, a uh, fair accurate representation of what occurred. Uh, I also think that without uh, some, uh, somebody to provide a descriptor of exactly what's happening uh, off camera as well as on camera, uh, it's not uh, necessarily relevant to showing the, the whole picture of what happened. Your Honor, if I may, I would argue that um, Rule 1101B3 uh, makes it clear that the rules of evidence do not apply to violations of probation. And um, the rules that the defense sites are the 900 rules of, uh, about authentication. The only, um, this goes to the weight, in other words, how much weight you give the evidence, it should be admissible, and then you decide how much weight it's worth. The objections that we're going to allow, I'm going to allow the, the evidence to be admitted as a Thank you. First, um, I want you to describe, you, you watched this video, is that right? Yes. And describe, based on your experience with the defendant, um, you've had multiple conversations with him, were you able to recognize his voice on the video? Yes, at times, yes. And describe for the judge, just, um, the nature of what you heard the defendant saying on the video? I would just describe it as a, as a verbal altercation between two groups. I mean, you know, him as well as somebody else are making comments to other people on the other side of the square. So were these quiet comments, loud comments? Well, no, they were loud. Um, like I said, like a verbal altercation, a heated or, or loud um, verbal altercation between two groups. All right, so you, you describe two groups the group that the defendant is with, where are they? In, in Central Square, in the, in the actual uh, portion with the uh, gazebo. Right. Some kind of chalk event going on, is that right? From what I understand, yes. There was, there's been an ongoing heated exchange between two different groups over chalking in Central Square. Right. One group likes to chalk, the other group likes to wash, something like that? Yes. So there's yelling going on. Where's the other group of people? I believe they're down in front of Pedraza's, the Mexican restaurant that's on the other side of the road, or the, or the square. Um, what, if anything, um, sort of triggered an altercation between these two, two groups? Well, I believe it's just derogatory remarks back and forth, but specifically to one gentleman who eventually took offense to the comments and came across the square. All right. The comments that were made that, that triggered this other person to come across the square, those were not made by the defendant, right? I don't believe they were. I believe it was another person that, that made the final comment that caused the gentleman to come across. Um, and Your Honor, you're going to have to forgive my, my language here for a moment. The person not in the defendant's group across the square was saying, again, Suck a dick, right? Correct. And then the gentleman that is with the defendant but not the defendant uh, said, I'm sorry, I can't afford your services. Is that right? Yes. Which the person across the street, not in the defendant's group, took apparent offense to, right? Right. And then 
that group across the street near the garage has come across into the square. Is that right? Yes. Yes. All right. So that's sort of the stage. What do you see in the video based on your experience with the defendant, uh, recognizing his voice and his face and so forth? What did you see in the video from that point forward? Well, a brief altercation occurs that doesn't involve the defendant initially. I think there's a, a someone gets hit. There's some some uh, bantering going on. Uh, again, an altercation, and then the defendant steps forward um, with what I believe to be a, a club of some sort in his hand to try to ward off the the person that was coming across the street. Okay. And there's there is no place in the video, in fairness, where the defendant hits anyone with that, right? No, there's nothing part of that sort. Right. But it is in his hand and appears to be used uh, without hitting anyone, being held in kind of a weapon manner. Yes. Fair to say? Yes. All right. Um, this altercation breaks up eventually. So yes. it, it appears someone got hit, although you can't see it in the video, right? Yes. All right. And then the groups, after a lot of yelling, would you say? Yes, fair enough. They break apart. Mm -hmm. All right. And, um, and then there's a fair amount of downtime in the video. And um, at the end, you can hear the defendant say, we could definitely use some backup as much as you can muster. Is that right? Yes, I recognize his voice making that comment, yes.
because I think I can hear you speak.
to play any additional part of that right now? Or no, Your Honor. I, mean, I, I agree with the said that if there's anything on the video that has any bearing, it's the first three minutes, which is what I believe that they are. Thank you. And uh, if you, you wouldn't mind, Your Honor, just one question to make sure. Uh, um, PBO Smith, did you see what I was pointing to on the screen? And look now at the screen's turned so it's black. Then I would just ask that the witness come ahead and come on. Absolutely. If Mr. Smith is going to testify to the contents of the video, he can't. We still have the same foundational problem. He wasn't there. I mean, the, the rules of evidence do not apply to probation hearings. The problem is, I mean, relevance still applies. I agree. The, the dot, if, if it's to have him identify something that, or to describe something that's contained on, on the video, I think the video is the best evidence of of that that objection sustained. Uh, and if, just for the record, Your Honor. Um, I was only going to have the witness explain that the thing that appears to be in his hand was what he was talking about when he testified. That, that's all. Okay. All right. I, I think I understand that. It, and if you'd answer that question, could you ask again? I, I you don't talked about um, on the video seeing who you recognize the person who you recognize to be the defendant carrying what looks to you to be <coughs> some kind of stick. Is that right? Yes. And that's what's depicted. That's depicted on this video. Yes, somewhere between three and four minutes. That's a time period of three and four minutes with the video. Yes. Thank you. That's all. Um, I have no further questions. Cross examination. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, absent uh, the anonymous tip in this video, uh, if, if would you have filed the probation violation on this call and been court? Not. Even though there was previous other violations alleged, I would not have filed it had not the, the video come forward. The uh, item that is uh, uh, depicted in what you believe is Mr. Paul's hand, how heavy was it? I have no idea. How heavy was it? No idea. Uh, how uh, lethal was it? I have no way, no way of knowing that. Uh, you uh, had described uh, the actions that when you were testifying before we watched the video, the actions of Mr. Paul uh, in uh, taking up this stick or whatever it was uh, that he was attempting to ward off the uh, the others. Is that right? That's the way I saw it, yes. Uh, that is, is that um, these other people were coming to do violence and he was trying to not have somebody be violently acting on. You can say that, yes. I guess what I meant by that was that he didn't hit anybody or strike or swing at anybody. He just took a posture. Um, it is, uh, he used it as a shield more than a sword. I guess you could put it that way, yeah. Uh, the statements of Mr. Paul uh, that you recognize, they're, they're, uh, I, I believe there were three male voices there. Uh, I believe that um, the only things that you're able to identify Mr. Paul is saying is uh, goodbye, Mr. Boston. Something like that. I believe there's a couple other here, a couple other lines that are in there that I have memorized, but that, that I hear him, what I believe to be his voice, yes. Uh, he does not threaten to do violence against anyone. Not that I recall. No. Uh, the the uh, uh, rather angry man uh, who is coming across the street with the backpack, though, he does threaten violence against people. I believe so, yeah. Uh, one of the things that he threatens to do is, is take the video camera. Yes. And, and later on in the video, he actually does take the video 